I think we'd better move on now to our next talk by Dr. Jim Gayling. Jim is Senior Research Scientist at the South Australian Museum and also an affiliate professor at the Sprigg Geobiology Centre at the University of, Australia, of Adelaide. And he is a um, well-known expert on the Ediacaran fossils, uh, which he will talk to us about this afternoon. So thank you, Jim. Thank you, Wolfgang. I'm going to talk to you about the Adelaide Rift complex and its role in our argument that we have a list of serial sites which we are intending to put together as a case for um, a proposal for a World Heritage listing of the Icara Flinders Ranges. I come at the end of a very long history of study of the Adelaide Rift Complex. There are, uh, it started in a sense with the work, much publicised work of Sir Douglas Mawson in producing this cross section, which was represented, I believe, on our $50 or $100 note, which has since gone extinct. But nonetheless, it demonstrated a cross section through what is now the Bratchena Trail through that part of the Flinders Ranges, and it drew attention to the exposure of the rock formations in a unique part of Earth's history. And it begins not in the central Flinders Ranges, but it begins actually in um, Akarula. Um, we produced this rather crude cartoon to illustrate in, in a very simplified fashion, the complex that we're talking about for this proposal for a, a serial listing in World Heritage. And that was to show that the Adelaide Rift Complex is in fact a whole system which runs from, if you like, Kangaroo Island and probably down into Antarctic if we ever find out where it was, right up in uh, underneath the Aramanga Basin. But certainly um, it's exposed in its anatomy perhaps best in the Arkarula wilderness area and that's a good place to start this whole concept, to actually have a look at um, the window to the uh, thickness of the sediments of the Adelaide Geos incline, but especially to the igneous rocks and the igneous origins of what puts together this rift complex. The heat flow that runs underneath what we call the Adelaide Rift Complex um, has been explained to us by various people. Uh, recently, a talk by Tom Ramondo, which demonstrated that this heat flow, which is generated well underneath um, this belt right into the centre of Australia, almost certainly probably continues under Antarctica and may have something to do with ice melting. It has been around for a long time and it's undoubtedly a part of the whole story of the the Adelaide Rift Complex. We begin, of course, with Arkarul. It's an essential um, view. It's a window to what was happening. The best way of explaining the importance of Arkarul is to say that if you've ever have been to Yellowstone National Park, you're looking at one moment in time of what might have been Arkarul about um, 1.5 billion years ago. And it extends right through until the Cenozoic today. So it provides for us a very unique look at what undoubtedly underlies much of the Adelaide Rift Complex in many places. That jewel box of the Flinders Ranges is an essential part of this whole program. There we see one of the most extremely thick deposits of the Sturt Ice Age that are represented in those tillites fault bounded necessarily, but they give you some idea of the scale of ice that occurred during that um, glaciation. Then, as Mari has just talked about, the importance of the stromatolites, both in the pre-Sturt Ice Age, if you go to many parts of Flinders Ranges, the Skilligalee, Dolomite, um, the, much of the Belair subgroup, are dark coloured rocks. Undoubtedly, they were reservoirs of organic matter during their time. There not, might not be much today. But also, in between the Sturt and the Alatner Ice Age, we have um, the Tapley Hill Shale and uh, other rocks which give us clues to the amount of organic material being put aside. They probably had a lot to do with this oscillation in the Earth's 
oxygen carbon dioxide ratio, which gave rise to these massive ice ages, which have been demonstrated here almost uniquely as have gone to very low latitudes, in other words, right to the equator. The evidence uncovered by people like George Williams and Phil Schmidt in terms of the Paleo Mag is vital to this story. Here is the place where we can demonstrate that these were truly, at least for short periods of time, global ice ages. And with all of that going on, we happen to know that there is um, Ediacaran oil and, and perhaps even earlier oil in places like Oman, um, which has a certain characteristic of it. So the fluctuation that we have between a, a warming time and an ice age time is probably to do with this massive ice oscillation between carbon dioxide put out at times of ice ages and the locking away of that carbon dioxide as organic matter at times in between. So part of that story is, of course, the one that George Williams has so beautifully demonstrated to us of the Alatna tidal rhythmites. This is a fantastic record of what was happening in the ocean down to the uh, day and tides, but uh, 535, 550 million years ago. And we see evidence there that um, there were actually um, perhaps times where ice was floating above that. It may have been actually open ocean, may not have been a continuous ice sheet, but we actually have lumps of granite sinking into those rhythmites in various places. This all led in the long term to defining the base of the Ediacaran period the first golden spike ever to be placed anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere, let alone Australia, in this remote part of the Flinders Range is quite near the Bratchner Gorge Geological Trail. This is as it looks today. It's a little bit embarrassing because the sign has long since been washed out, restored, washed out, and um, there's not that much to see. Nonetheless, when it was dedicated, it certainly drew a lot of our colleagues because symbolically, this is the first geological period to have been defined in the last 100 to 120 um, uh, years and, as I said, the first in the Southern Hemisphere. So when you look at the characteristics of that boundary, the cap carbonate, the Nuckalina, sitting above the Alatna formation, you can go to South China and put your finger on the same level as this group was doing uh, on a couple of the visits I've been to China. Luckily, um, our definition of that boundary came about three years before the ashes were found in China, um, which gave us our age of five, 635 and another ash in the Nanto Tillite, which pretty much gave us the date that we all quote for South Australia, but for which we have no ash deposit. Nonetheless, this is where the golden spike is. So we go on to halfway up through the Ediacaran period, roughly, because we have no proper ash layers, to the Bunyaroo Formation, and uh, then I need to go back. Therein is this unique layer, which we call the Ackerman Ejector Layer. We know the story, I won't go through it again, uh, a bolide which has actually splattered bits of fragments from the Gawler Ranges right around the Flinders Ranges can be used as our only certain timeline. And it's associated with some evidence of ice, whether that was ice was, was just a chance coincidence because in, there's some evidence that there was some debris before, underneath the Ackerman layer as well as above. We don't know whether there is any connection between these two events. The Wanaka Formation is one of the least well studied. It was a brilliant job was done um, by uh, a, um, one, one of our colleagues, who, who, uh, Peter Haynes, who, who described s some very early Ediacaran fossils in Paleopaschichnus, these strange things that some people thought were trace fossils, but almost certainly not. There are all sorts of other weird objects, as well as good evidence that this was a deep water carbonate slope and canyon field section, which in itself has produced a lot of argument. But very little work has since been done within the, the uh, Wanaka Formation. It's famous because it bears what was often called the uh, Sharam excursion. In fact, it was first described here, where we have the wildest fluctuation of carbon isotopes ever recorded in Earth history, and that sits right within our Wanaka Formation. And then we get to the Ediacara biota, which gives the name of this formation, right really in the middle of Bratchner Gorge, and we'll go back again, 
um, and we see a window where there are, we now believe, two members which make up what formerly was called the Ediacara member. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but that was uh, um, the site which demonstrated conclusively back in 1968 that Ediacara fossils occurred well below the Cambrian. There's 400 metres of, of sandstone without fossils sitting on top of the Ediacara fossil beds in Bratchner Gorge and many other places in the Flinders Ranges. In these rocks, we get the very earliest evidence of animals, and that are these meandering trace fossils. There is something which is avoiding crossing itself, and some of those beasts are found in the Ediacara bioda, both from Nilpena and from Ediacara. This seems to have a mind of its own. Um, this is Nilpena, um, where... Um, okay, it wants me to get through quickly. This is Nilpena, where... Um, for the last 18 years, we have been excavating samples of seafloors that now exceed 350 square metres and, and about 12 different beds have been excavated and they do very well if um, left alone, protected in a desert environment. You can come back and see the fossils on the bases of these beds all turned up, fitted back together, cleaned off by thousands of hours of work by volunteers from the South Australian Museum and by my colleague Mary Droser and, and her extended family and students from the University of California. This is an exciting site because it turns out that Nilpena geology is way more ex uh, uh, exotic than we actually thought. Richard Jenkins uh, um, and Chris Nedden first got an eye to this and since we've been mapping it over the last 10 years or so, we realise that we have two major incisions cut through the underlying um, uh, unphiloceriferous member, the, the Chase Sandstone member, and down right through the Bonnie Sandstone down to the Wanaka Formation. These explain a lot of very weird things in the main, main part of the ranges, and they have quite distinctive facies which are uh, being described. So here's a stylized diagram of what we get with two major incisions with somewhat different assemblages in those two incisions. And they extend um, the top one, the, the Nilpena sandstone member, as yet not published, um, is not found at Ediacara to the north. It's only found at Nilpena, but the lower one is, is the most complex one, and that's the original Ediacara sandstone member. Um, so capping all this is the Parachuna formation in most places, except in the northern Flinders Ranges, where we get an intervening unit called the Uritana. And the Uritana, curiously, shows a few organisms which actually... Um, no one knows what they are. They are not Ediacara fossils per se, and they represent no known Cambrian fossils. But, but those, along with much more complex trace systems, are found within the Uritana formation in, in a, a delta complex which finds up to the top where we have the uh, Parachuna formation. And above the Parachuna formation, um, the, largely the siliciclastic sedimentation stops and we get these massive archaeocyath build-ups or biomes, as you might hope, with the most spectacular deposits in many places in the Flinders Ranges. This is one at the Ajax Plateau, but you get beautiful material in Bratchner Gorge. And when you go in the units above that, the Myrna Myrna Formation, and, and uh, coeval with it, you get a very rich... Um, small shelly fossil assemblage which enable us to correlate into early Cambrian successions all around the world. Um, sitting on top of that, the Morawi formation and, uh, at the east end of Chambers Gorge has the first coral morphs. These look all the world to me like tabulate corals but the aficionados say they have to be called tabulate grade corals. And for the first time, we see the animals that were making reefs other than microbial um, fossils for the rest of, of time since then. Um, and then capping this in the, in the Wiriapa formation, we get the things that look like muddy stromatolites. They are thrombolites. They are being... Something is already eating the layers of the stromatolites. There are animals de 
determined to actually destroy the microbial record that we have, especially well developed in the Ediacaran world. All of that changes. We will never get soft-bodied animals preserved in sandstone again because that is the beginning of the phanerogic ecosystem and that is the end of our serial list of Ediacaran sites. This is a package, and that's the argument they'll make here today. It's not just Nilpena, it's not just Ediacara, it's those together with their context in the Flinders Ranges. Thank you.